so good evening all or good morning from whichever part of the world you are so today we have uh, mr peter salak with us and miss uh, and peter is a senior tunneling tunnel engineer from czech republic with extensive experience in design and supervision of uh, major infrastructure projects peter is a steering board member of itacus and proud founder of international tunneling association young members group and pass and also the past chair of uh, tunneling society british tunneling society young members group and in the year of 2014 he was actually a, a, awarded a young tunnelers award by iti and in 2017 peter co initiated the think deep uh, uk to help our cities become more resilient sustainable and livable uh, and uh, in 2018 peter moved to uh, israel to establish dr sewer and partners there and currently he is a managing director and senior tunnel engineer uh at uh, dr sir and partners israel and uh, uh he is responsible for companies operations business and providing technical expertise to most challenging projects there such as red line and metro m2 tlv uh desalination plant french hill tunnels in jerusalem and the hydro hydro power plant so uh we welcome uh, we welcome you uh, peter on our uh, tiym platform the the stage is all yours thank you so much uh good evening everyone uh thank you so much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity uh to give you this uh, presentation i am very happy that uh, i have the the opportunity to do that so uh i hope that uh, you can see my presentation and you can hear me well and if that's the case then we will start the the presentation yes peter your screen is visible and you are audible excellent so if, if if it's there any problem i'll just inform you fantastic uh, so uh, the presentation which i will be presenting uh, is titled the design and construction of an atm stations uh, this is mainly for uh, metro uh, systems and uh, lrt systems the the agenda of my presentation is uh, I will give you an introduction then I will be talking about innovations which are driving efficient design and construction then we will talk about an ATM then I will be showing you how the excavation and support sequence are done in these large uh, mine stations and we will talk also about the waterproofing and last but not least will be a uh, uh, final lining so let's start with the introduction So uh, in uh, comparison to cut and cover, uh, mine stations are done uh, usually through shafts and uh, they have a small point of entry. Uh, the main difference between the open cut is obviously that uh, the open cut uh, is uh, fairly uh, disruptive uh, way how to do stations. However, sometimes uh, it is the best uh, way how to do these stations. so what we are always saying uh, if you will use cut and cover or mine station that needs to be caref carefully examined and uh, you know uh, traffic restriction uh, utilities uh, the neighborhoods uh, and so on will then kind of uh, decide if it will be an atm station or cut and cover station uh, but today we will be talking about the mine stations so uh, the construction impacts uh, of the traditional cut and cover are kind of uh, visible from these uh, pictures they are fairly disruptive to the uh, to the neighborhood and the picture on the left is actually about 100 meters from my office where i sit now uh, talking to you uh, so uh, the disruption is really really visible another thing which i mentioned is 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 utilities you can see an example on the uh, right photo um you know how busy the streets are with the utilities and when you then need to relocate all of them uh, uh or uh, divert uh, then uh, obviously uh, that that takes a lot of time and money and effort uh, usually the utilities are the main issues of delays in uh, executing uh, cut and cover stations and also uh, sometimes when you do cut and cover station and you close the road for a long time Uh, you are creating long term or socio uh, economic uh, impact uh, what it means it's uh, these photos are from san francisco 
where the the, the local shops uh, did not recover and didn't open even uh, when the station was then uh, then put in service because people just forget after these three four years to actually go there. Uh, the cut and cover stations uh, have, uh, on the other hand, a lot of advantages in comparison to the mine stations. It's a very traditional construction technique, which is very well known. Uh, you find local expertise uh, in almost every city around the world where you go. And also these stations are usually much more spacious and large. You have more uh, space for mechanical and electrical equipment, uh, more shops, for example, and so on and so on. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, you sometimes have to demolish some buildings, uh, uh, closure the roads, uh, relocate utilities, you have dust and noise, and uh, as I mentioned, sometimes negative effect on the local businesses. Now let's talk about the mine stations. Uh, they basically do the opposite. You don't have uh, road closures, you don't uh, demolish the buildings and uh, you are creating or you have a better city environment uh, and you have also possibility for oversight uh, development such as example from London uh, here so basically the uh, you know the area where you have your uh, shaft or the head house uh, can be very well commercially used uh, you know for uh, houses or for offices so sometimes you can even get money back uh, in, in this way the disadvantages uh, need for experienced contractor and designer of these mine stations. Uh, tunneling is inherently more risky than uh, cut and cover, even though when you are doing deep cut and cover stations, uh, then uh, things can go wrong as well, especially with, uh, with the high groundwater levels. Uh, but and also the mine station, they have a uh, less space uh, in, in the caverns because the tunnels we are obviously trying to make as small as possible uh, to allow the construction, but also make them, you know, uh, safely and, and economically. So I am now moving into uh, an ATM stations. Uh, this is a general slide which will explain you when I say uh, new Austrian tunneling method, what I mean by that sometimes uh, or actually according to the ITA, it should be referred to this method as a conventional tunneling with short grid support. Uh, in the UK, this method is called uh, SEL. Uh, in USA, it's called uh, sequential excavation method, so SEM. Uh, but generally, people call it mine tunneling or mine stations. The characteristics of these stations that they are very uh, flexible. You can do any shape and any configuration. Uh, they are feasible in very difficult ground conditions and uh, they have a global proven track record. They've been done on all, uh, all continents. The, the advantage is it's cost effective, eliminates uh, surface disruption and white uh, urban mass, as I mentioned. Uh, the three stations uh, which you see on the pictures uh, are different configurations uh, with the, um, at the top. It's a Beacon Hill station with separated platform tunnels. In the middle, it's uh, Eglinton in Toronto. Uh, and uh, at the bottom is a bank station capacity upgrade from, from London. So you should see that really you can have different shapes, different configurations. And the SCL is very flexible, so it allows you to, to do that. The most common NATM stations configurations, it's either the large cavern, which I mentioned, or uh, so-called, uh, or as you can uh, refer to it like a more this crossrail style would be used in London, uh, where you have a concourse tunnel in the middle and then it's connected by cross passages, the, the platform tunnels. Uh, or you can also have a trinocular uh, station, which is also, uh, also being uh, used and done quite frequently. So now I would like to move into innovations uh, driving efficient design and, and construction. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all of these technologies and innovations, so I will mainly focus on the design because that's what uh, I am doing uh, and uh, Dr. Sauer and partners mainly. Uh, but in general, let's talk about these new technologies and innovations. So what do we have today? We have advanced uh, computing tools. Uh, you know, the 
Uh, right now, we progress so much in the technology that we can do really complicated 3D mo models actually fairly fast in comparison to the past. We also have a more powerful uh, um, uh, PCs, so you know these uh, calculations don't, don't take as long as they did uh, 10 years ago. We also have uh, improved construction uh, methods uh, and improved construction materials, uh, mainly shotcrete. Uh, is uh, improved uh, in last uh, five, 10 years significantly. And also we have advanced uh, ground treatment uh, concepts. All of this together uh, is giving us opportunity to build these uh, really large caverns in the middle of uh, our busy cities, uh, such as the one in the middle on the picture. So I told you that I will be talking about key innovations, but I will focus uh, because of the uh, time limits only on the short grid lining design. Uh, in this picture, you can see what kind of a difference you will have if you will be uh, uh, calculating your short grid as a elastic or a plastic. Our company invested a lot of time and money into develop, developing uh, uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, models for a uh, for a concrete, uh, we use uh, damage plasticity uh, concrete models, which are really, uh, you know, allowing for this nonlinear behavior and also uh, ductility and the joints and uh, and so on. So uh, at the bottom, uh, you see two capacity limit curves, one with uh, elastic behavior and one with plastic. And you can see that basically just because of the different uh, analysis method, uh, my lining doesn't need any uh, extra reinforcement. On the other hand, if you will be doing uh, just normal elastic design, you will uh, finish uh, your design with uh, a lot of reinforcement, which is not necessary in a sprayed concrete lining with uh, steel fibers. Uh, we are using as a company this uh, shot grid shell uh, for large and complex tunnels, and these caverns are, you know, having large openings, and we are actually not 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 using uh, any more the traditional uh, rebar reinforcement. This uh, picture, you can see how far we are in in actually um, modeling the behavior of the concrete. So you see on the right hand side the laboratory test, which is quite commonly used for the uh, steel fiber reinforced uh, concrete. And then on the uh, on the picture next to it, uh, you see uh, you know when we are using the the advanced models uh, for the shotcrete, this concrete damage plasticity model. Uh, you see that the behavior of the shotcrete is extremely well represented uh, and uh, it's basically matching the, the test. On the other hand, if you are doing a linear elastic model, you will never ever be able to uh, model anything uh, close to the reality. So how did we move, uh, you know, in, in our designs? Uh, I was working for many years on this uh, fantastic project called uh, Crossrail, now called Elizabeth Line in, in London. Uh, we were designing these tunnels with a uh, little bit uh, thicker uh, primary linings and with the traditional reinforcement. Uh, but I'm happy that uh, since then uh, the industry uh, moved uh, and uh, we were able to deliver uh, a couple of years ago project in in uh, in Toronto uh, where we did a large cavern uh, where uh, the lining was about 550 millimeter uh, thick uh, but the opening was more than 220 square meters and there was no single bar reinforcement around these openings so only a uh, shot creed with fibers and that's it nothing else So uh, let's talk about uh, also uh, also owners and, and, and clients. Uh, this is a minister of uh, transportation from from Australia, and he said that the over designed mega projects are bad for environment and also uh, taxpayers. Obviously, um, uh, the owners, uh, in my opinion, are also partly responsible for this uh, this problem uh, because sometimes they go for the lowest cost for the design work. Um, uh, this is really bad approach because if you uh, give someone more time and uh, and basically allow him to do the design properly and slowly, the savings uh, in the construction are uh, enormous. 
Um, and also sometimes we in uh, our tunneling industry, we need to comply with building codes which are not intended for tunneling work. So that's also uh, something what every country needs to do uh, to make sure that they have actually uh, tunneling codes uh, to design for uh, with, uh, not to use some, some building codes which make no sense. Uh, in terms of carbon footprint, uh, we did this comparison on one of our projects where some of the stations were NATM and some of them were cut and cover. Uh, the, um, the chart is showing is that uh, the mine stations actually are using less concrete and less steel in general, uh, and uh, they are actually uh, more environmentally uh, friendly. Um, this is uh, obviously um, relative, depending, you know, how shallow is the cut and cover uh, and the NATM and so on. But uh, it's definitely uh, something what I wanted to show you uh, that uh, these NATM stations are also good from from a sustainability point of view. So some examples of projects uh, which we which we did uh, as a company. Uh, this is an example from San Francisco. This is a Chinatown station uh, where we did uh, uh, shaft, uh, so-called headhouse, which has all the mechanical and electrical equipment or the majority in the shaft. And then we created a cross cut from the, uh, from the uh, shaft. And from that, we break uh, the, the platform cavern. And uh, the platform cavern was then uh, followed by crossover. So you have the, the people basically, you know, uh, boarding and exiting the state uh, the trains and then the train also can uh, change from one track to another um, later on. I think that it will be useful if I will start using uh, this. So yeah, so here is the here is the platform tunnel and here is the crossover. Okay, and then uh, on this uh, very same uh, project, this is a, a photo uh, showing you what we were basically dealing with. Uh, we purchased small house uh, which was here. Uh, we demolished this, that, that house and started to do this uh, large, uh, large shaft. Then we did the cross cut, uh, did the crossover cavern and the platform cavern without disrupting this uh, very busy street. And actually the community here, uh, in this case, uh, Chinese community, uh, because it, this, this place it's called Chinatown and uh, they demanded that their restaurants and, uh, and uh, shops will not be closed. Uh, so they mandated uh, mine station here and, and the, the, um, the city listened to them. And that's uh, basically uh, why we did this NATM station here, uh, basically no disruptions. And when this uh, shaft was completed, Obviously, there was new development uh, on uh, on top of the shaft, uh, so-called oversight development. Uh, moving to uh, Crossrail again, uh, this is a station which I was working on for over three years. This is a Farringdon station in the middle of of, uh, of Crossrail alignment, and uh, here is the configuration. Uh, I can tell you that this escalator was very difficult to design and construct because it's on an angle from the shaft, uh, but it was really, really good uh, project. I have good memories. A uh, few more project, a few more photos from that, uh, from that project. Uh, you see, uh, uh, we had the uh, TBM pilot, then we did top heading bench and invert. Um, this is a project uh, also from London called Bank Station Capacity Upgrade. Uh, you see it's almost uh, like a spaghetti system. Uh, the green stuff is the new, uh, new tunnels which we are building with connections to the existing network, which is in gray. Uh, when we were doing these, uh, these green tunnels, uh, we were almost not disrupting uh, the, the passengers and the trains in the, uh, in the existing tunnels. Uh, there was almost no disruption, only where we had to uh, breakthrough into the existing tunnel. We did this in the engineering hours, but uh, overall the, um, the services were not really disrupted. And few photos from uh, from Bank Station uh, to show you what we did. 
Uh, this is all in, in soft ground. This is in London clay. And you can see how large these tunnels are in, in, in this uh, soft ground uh, environment. So now uh, I would like to talk to you about a uh, little bit what the uh, new Austrian tunneling method uh, has and why it's uh, basically so successful in also difficult ground conditions. Uh, the, the main uh, aspect of the NATM is the availability of the tools which you can use. The amount of tools is, is really large. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, pre-support, face support, sidewall improvements, annular support. We also have some other special methods such as jet grouting and ground freezing. And with all these tools, uh, we can really build these uh, um, uh, these large caverns in uh, in uh, uh, fairly shallow conditions and uh, in very busy cities. And you see here the the sizes of these these caverns. Uh, here are people for your for your reference. This is a traditional method which we are using for um, uh, for excavating these large uh, stations. Stations. It call, it's called double side wall drift, and the sequence is is shown here. But I will be talking about that sequence in very great detail uh, later on. Uh, the equipment uh, which we are using for uh, uh, for uh, our NATM tunneling is fairly simple. What we need is a tunnel excavator. We need a mixer. Uh, we need a boom, a jumbo. Then we need a spraying robot, and we need a loader. Uh, so it's it's fairly simple. What are the mitigation measures which I showed you in that uh, that toolbox? Uh, for example, we can do internal dewatering. In this case, for example, we send the TBM first, and then we start to do the dewatering before we started to large enlarge the the TBM tunnels in the station into the full scale uh, uh, platform caverns. Uh, when we had really uh, bad uh, conditions, we did the chemical grouting. Uh, sometimes uh, when the roof is unstable, uh, we are using uh, grouted uh, or uh, um, just hammered uh, spiles. Uh, and we can also use uh, pocket excavation, meaning really small pocket is excavated and sprayed. Then you do another pocket, then sprayed. This is like a collage of, of different uh, pockets. Um, uh, when we when we worked, uh, this is also from from Farringdon Station, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then uh, the important aspect also about uh, mining is obviously uh, um, groundwater, uh, which we which we have, uh, and how we how we control it. So we either do dewatering or uh, water control. Uh, the dewatering is sometimes from a surface. Uh, you see these surface wells shown uh, here. This is also one of our projects. Uh, and uh, we can also do uh, internal dewatering or we combine the, the surface and internal dewatering. The, uh, the other water control uh, measures are, uh, for example, ground freezing, jet grouting or internal grouting. Uh, this is example basically uh, of a combination of a surface dewatering with uh, internal dewatering. Here was a building, so we couldn't do the surface well. Uh, the surface well is preferable if you have space. Then you know I would I would do that. But if you don't have the uh, the, the space, then you can always do the dewatering from the TBM tunnels, uh, for example, uh, for you to be able to do the. Uh, the NATM cavern. And in a uh, few pictures before I will go into the details, so uh, how we are doing these, uh, these uh, large NATM caverns is that we start in very small headings, uh, uh, then you know, support them, support them with shotcrete. Um, this is basically when the, uh, the, the drifts are already in, and uh, here we are starting to remove them. And then we have available the full uh, the full stations for waterproofing and then for secondary linings. So now it's time to uh, to move into the excavation and support sequence in in more detail. So here we go. 
so now on this uh, on these uh, slides, I will show you uh, the the excavation and support sequence of these uh, of these tunnels. We obviously first installed the pipe roof, uh, the steel pipes, uh, and then uh, we started to do the excavation of the first uh, top heading. So when the top heading uh, is basically gone, um, so uh, one thing before I will continue, what I want to mention is that on the left hand side, I'm kind of showing what uh, equipment do you need to do this operation uh, on a surface and underground. And then uh, on the right hand side, on the top, you see this schematic uh, um, schematic uh, uh, diagram, which is showing what we excavated. And then at the bottom, you will always show, you will always see photo, which is basically going together with the diagram to give you also the, the real um, um, uh, kind of a picture uh, what's what's going on in, in each step. So after we have the top heading uh, done, then we need to uh, uh, install the lattice girder and start to do the uh, spraying of the of the concrete. Then we do the uh, the bench support it. Uh, in this case, we uh, went also for the temporary invert uh, of the of the bench, and then you start on the other side with uh, uh, with the uh, with the drift number two. Uh, you remove the top heading, install the lining do the bench and uh, install the lining uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, we are moving uh, moving forward. Um, look at these two photos, which are basically showing you what's the status of the of the tunnel in, in, in reality. And then we started to remove the invert of the drift number one, remove the temporary invert and close the close the drift uh, number one. And we will move to drift number two and we will do the same. When this is all done, uh, we can uh, start uh, installing the pipe roof umbrella in the central drift. And then uh, we do the top heading, support, bench. And then we do the invert. Uh, this is actually a good photo. I will go back. You see, uh, you need to be very careful when you are designing these, uh, these uh, um, these side walls that you have enough space uh, for the for the equipment. What we as a company are always doing that when we are designing these stations, we always ask the contractor for uh, for uh, specifications of the equipment which he has because you need to make sure that you know the excavator, uh, the spraying machine, and everything can fit into these narrow spaces. Uh, so you know this is very carefully designed that everything fits uh, fits in. And then uh, we do the invert of the uh, of the central drift, and uh, voila, the station is is almost completed. The only thing what uh, still needs to be done uh, is that uh, we will start removing the temporary uh, sidewall uh, sidewalls. So one is out, and then second is out, and when this is done, then it's time to start to do waterproofing. So waterproofing in mine stations, uh, they can be waterproofed by either uh, by watertight concrete, by sheet membranes, or by sprayed applied waterproofing membranes. So why do we need to waterproof our mine stations? Uh, the, the reason is that uh, nowadays we are uh, doing typical uh, design life of around 120 uh, years. So you really need to make sure that uh, the, the waterproofing works uh, very well. Uh, you need to also think about the maintenance of the drainage system. Uh, you know that it can be reduced. And then uh, repairing water damages of the equipment, of the rails and so on is very expensive. So you really want to create a dry environment, uh, you know, not just for the equipment and for the, the, uh, the systems, but also for the people. You don't want to have a station, you know, where some water is dripping on uh, on escalators and stuff like that. So, uh, so waterproofing is extremely, extremely important. 
there are different levels of water tightness. So depending in in uh, in which location you are, you can choose if you want to completely dry or dry to light damp, damp or uh, damp to wet. Uh, you know there are standards, uh, and uh, obviously different clients will prefer different uh, uh, water tightness classes uh, for their structures, which you need to meet as a designer and as a contractor. Uh, let's talk about uh, sheet membranes. Uh, it's uh, by far the most common method uh, for waterproofing uh, a tunnel. Can deal with all kinds of water ingress, even when you are really submerged, uh, you know, let's say 60, 70 meter deep, and you have really large uh, water pressures, five bars and more, uh, then the sheet membrane is usually, you know, the product to go. Uh, it's economical, uh, it's very good for uh, linear uh, tunnels. Uh, obviously, when you have a lot of junctions, it's a little bit more difficult to install it, but still it can be done. We are doing it very often. Uh, and uh, here are some photos from the from a project. This is, uh, for example, uh, doing sheet membrane in a cross passage. Um, you can see on the right hand side that, you know, when you have a, a shape changing, uh, locations, you know, that's where it, where it gets fairly tricky, but because we have now double welding and we have all these systems and tests uh, which are shown on the on the on the top, then we can be quite sure that you know what we are doing is 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 high quality and there will be no leakages. Uh, what is also good about the sheet membrane is that we are doing sections like compartments, and uh, what it means is that with uh, with uh, with all the water barriers and uh, control and grout pipes, uh, uh, we can make sure that even if we will have a leakage, that we can come back and do the the rain injections and so on to make sure that the water will be stopped. Uh, but again, if there is a leakage, it will be limited just to that compartment. So that's very difficult. Uh, that's very important for a sheet membrane to use these compartments. Here is a here is a photo from. Uh, from project uh, of Farringdon, you see the the membrane is done. Uh, the the water uh, stops uh, are still going to be installed, and uh, in my opinion, a very very nice photo showing you the the secondary lining already in place, the shutter moving uh, moving forward. So let's talk about uh, watertight concrete. Uh, many tunnels around the world are are uh, um, are using uh, watertight concrete. Uh, it's basically, you know, you are adding uh, chemicals into your concrete to make uh, the concrete low uh, permeability, and uh, you need to make sure that it's, uh, you know, uh, with low shrinking in, in situ concrete. Uh, the cracks uh, should be limited to 0 0.2 millimeter using reinforcement, uh, and you need to be very careful, obviously, with the construction joints. Uh, and um, again, it's uh, it's something what's being uh, used uh, commonly around the world, and uh, it's one of the options which you which you have. Now we are m moving into uh, sprayed waterproofing membranes. Uh, these are getting, uh, in my opinion, more and more popular. Uh, the reason why they are popular is that if you have a change of shape. Uh, to these membranes, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, the application is extremely fast. Um, and uh, so basically, you know, very good for geometrical changes. And it's it's also, as I said, very, uh, very good for construction. It's 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 fast. And uh, uh, there are many products, uh, you know, very, very, uh, very different systems. Here, I will show you some uh, some uh, some examples. So, uh, again, as I said, like uh, di different products from different uh, manufacturers, uh, different application, different testing methods. Uh, but uh, this has been now around for many many years, and some of these products uh, are actually extremely extremely reliable and 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 good. So when our waterproofing is 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 uh, is completed, then we are moving into uh, into fine linings. Uh, I will show you a, a sequence of of fine lining. I hope that you will like this uh, this 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 cartoon. But uh, when the invert uh, is cleaned, 
then uh, we start to do the uh, uh, the invert concrete. Then we do the the sides. Then we do the arch, and then we can do the platforms and uh, the the concourse slabs. When this is done, uh, you do the uh, slabs for the tracks. Uh, if necessary, there are some uh, um, systems, obviously, and then uh, the train and people can come and you can operate the station. So let's talk about it in more detail. Uh, this was just a very simply, uh, simple, simple graphic. So let's let's dive into it. So uh, you see on the picture uh, on the left uh, left uh, top corner that when the the invert is is completed, we start to do the we install the geotextile and then the sheet waterproofing. Uh, then uh, we installed usually protective concrete to make sure that the sheet membrane is not uh, not being damaged. Then we move to rebar installation. And then we do uh, conduit installation. Obviously, obviously, if you can avoid putting these uh, conduits into the invert, it's preferable. Obviously, you all know that you know when you are putting pipes into the concrete, it's difficult then to uh, to have the have the access uh, if something goes wrong. In this case, uh, you know we overcome this that we installed. Uh, significantly large number, uh, larger number of these conduits than we needed. So we were always sure that even if something will be uh, wrong with one or two pipes, we have still a large amount of pipes still available. Also for a future proofing, we had some uh, some conduits empty uh, just you know for the future what, what it will bring. But uh, again, I will say it, uh, if you can avoid this and you can put them to the sides uh, or to the uh, like uh, hide them behind the cladding, uh, it's always better. However, sometimes there is no way uh, and you need to put them into the concrete. Then the formwork uh, is installed and then you can finally uh, pour the concrete and then, uh, you know, um, apply the right chemicals on the concrete to make sure that it's curing properly, that you don't have cracks uh, and so on. And uh, this is a picture for you to really see you know how complicated and uh, um, also on this uh, picture you know just think about uh, the, the design coordination between all the all the disciplines uh, this was project which was done done recently so we were using uh, bim for uh, all the coordination and clash detection uh, but you still see how how complicated it is Here uh, you can see just uh, about to or, or in the middle of pouring the concrete. When the invert is finished, then we will start to do the sides. Uh, we call them a starter wall. Uh, when the waterproofing is finished uh, and the reinforcement is installed, we put the formwork and then we uh, do the concrete pour. And this is basically giving us the, the kicker for the, uh, for the arch. Uh, here you can see the, the arch uh, just before we will do the concreting of the arch. Uh, obviously, when you do concreting of the arch, make sure that you have uh, bleed pipes there and uh, there is uh, never void uh, in between the in between the membrane and uh, and basically the the concrete which you are uh, pouring. Uh, that will help you, you know, the, the bleed pipes uh, and later on you can do some uh, some contact grouting to make sure that, that everything is, is, is filled. And uh, moving on, uh, so the arch sequence, uh, we have here uh, the waterproofing geotextile is installed uh, and then the, the, the membrane. Um, then we do the rebar installation formwork uh, as, as, you, as you know, and then you are doing the, the concrete pour, uh, as you can see on the on the last uh, uh, on the last photo, you have uh, connection bars connecting, you know, the the old pore with the new uh, new section. Uh, also, what is interesting on this project is that because we have slab here uh, for people to walk on, we had here uh, these slots uh, that we could uh, install the the the, the, uh, the concrete slab here. 
So these slots allowed the, the future construction of the, uh, of the slab. And uh, this is the, the long station, which includes the crossover in, in one picture. This is about more than 400 meter, meter long. And uh, when, when this is all done, then you start installing the, 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 uh, the platforms and the systems and, and so on. And then uh, on the right hand side is visualization uh, of, of one of the stations. And then, you know, uh, one day you end up with the with the real station, which is which is constructed and in operation. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is LRT. This is light light rail uh, system on the right hand side. Just just after uh, just after the opening. What is very important uh, to say for me is the the platform of of, of success, and I like to talk about this. This is something what uh, Dr. Uh, Gerhard Sauer uh, was was telling us always is that you know you can have the best design, uh, but still you can have a, a very big problem if you don't have a good supervision, and if you have the best uh, supervision but the execution is is not very good, then you will always fail because if you remove one of these legs, uh, the uh, the platform will till and uh, you will have a disaster. So, you know, the design is very important. The supervision is, is very important and the execution as well. And you need to be very, very good in all these three aspects to, to succeed in your, in your project. So I'm now moving into, into conclusions. Uh, so the mine stations are now commonly used uh, and are comparable in terms of time and cost to, to cut and cover stations. Uh, I am uh, not promoting uh, uh, an ATM stations to cut and cover stations. What I'm always saying is that, uh, you know, horses for courses. So you always need to know what you are doing when. So sometimes the cut and cover station will be more appropriate than the NATM and vice, vice versa. The excavation of these NATM stations was now down uh, already also in some very extreme uh, soft ground conditions. Uh, in in rock, uh, it's obviously uh, simple. You know, hard the rock uh, with with less joints, it is more easier it gets. Uh, but when we are talking about, for example, sand, uh, you know, with with uh, with water, then that's uh, getting much more complicated. However, with uh, with the new technology which I demonstrate during my presentation, these stations can be also done in 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 sandy conditions. Uh, we have large number of, of waterproofing which are available. Uh, I would say that still if, if you have really, really high uh, uh, pressure of, of water, I would still go probably nowadays, even nowadays for a sheet membrane, uh, but uh, the, the sprayed membranes are really getting better and better and I use them successfully on a on number of projects. Same with the watertight concrete. So again, you need to know what you are looking for, what is exactly, uh, you know, the project uh, and what are the needs and what are the requirements. Uh, the, the final linings uh, require large amount of coordination between all uh, design disciplines. Uh, it's great that nowadays almost everyone works in, uh, in BIM, uh, all the disciplines seeing, you know, uh, uh, what the other discipline is doing. You are running clash detections, you can, you know, coordinate your design uh, very well. So, um, the likelihood of, 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 of big errors is, is fairly small nowadays, even though still you need to be very vigilant. Uh, what do you need to deliver a uh, successful uh, mine station in busy city? You need a good design, really good site supervision, and you need a very good and experienced contractor. When you have this, uh, you will deliver your project successfully. Uh, one thing which is very important to say at the end is that also, uh, owners are playing a huge role in this project, so everyone needs to cooperate. Uh, the owner, uh, the designer, uh, and the contractor. Only in this scenario, you know, the projects are are really good and and uh, successful. Uh, that's it from me. I would like to thank you so much for uh, uh, for your attention. Uh, if you want to contact me, there is a email address and a website. 
Um, I am sitting in Tel Aviv, which is one of our five offices of Dr. Sauer and Partners, and I will be more than happy now to uh, answer your questions uh, if you have uh, if you have any. Uh, hi, Peter. So it was a very excellent presentation on the metro lines and uh, the mine station. And uh, I, 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 I really like the part where you explain that uh, you ask the contractor about the equipments which they are using. That's that's what sometimes it it stays out of the mind of the designer. As as a young designer, it stays out of the mind that you have to actually ask what type of uh, machineries are to be used to get a good design and practical design as well. And yeah. your and your pres and uh, your explanation on waterproofing waterproofing was also quite good. It it, it it covered it covered a lot uh, of, uh, as for the waterproofing. And OK, uh, any any questions for Peter? You can uh, type or you can just raise your hand and just speak out your question. I will prefer if people will ask then type it, but uh, I'm a uh, nice guy as, as Rushi is, so you don't need to be afraid of us. Just uh, unmute so, yourself. Uh, please, let's start this discussion. Yeah, so Sai Santosh, Mr. Sai Santosh has raised his hand. You can just ask him the question, Mr. Sai Santosh. Hi, Peter. Uh, uh, is it hard? Hello. 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 Yeah, you're, you're audible. You can speak out. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Peter, for sharing, sharing your experience and everything. We are like at present, uh, we are young engineers uh, who are actively participating in big projects, high speed projects, high speed rail projects in India. Uh, which are like in mountain tunnels, we are doing this NATM uh, method of excavation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in, in one of your presentation, in one of your slides, you said you are using multi drift uh, method, like step by step, you are uh, uh, excavating, right? First, tunnels, we are, TBMs will go through, and then step by step excavation you are going to do, right? Yes. Uh, that site, like the two um, ribs, or I don't know what is the name, the two short cleat layers are there, na? and finally you are going to remove. Yeah, the side walls, he's talking about the side walls. Yes, yes, side walls. Yes, so, uh, um, so in terms of the the TBMs, uh, if they go through the station first or or they go after, that's obviously depends on many, many factors. Uh, you know, uh, if you can uh, send the TBMs before you start the stations, this is something mm -hmm. what I really, we as a company also recommend. We think that the TBM first is very good option. I will explain why. Because when you then go into these TBM tunnels, you can then do radial uh, probe drilling through this uh, tunnel and really get very good uh, understanding of the geology, which is in the area where you will be doing the, the, the station. Uh, so you can do you know, your exploration from that uh, TBM tunnel, but you can also do dewatering and you can also do grouting and so on from the TBM tunnel. That's why we like to send these TBM first when we are before we are enlarging the stations. However, if we cannot send these TBMs first, then we need, first need to do the stations and then receive the TBM and drag the TBM through the NATM station and then restart it. That can be done as well, and it's not a problem. Uh, we are just saying that uh, usually uh, or we prefer that these TBMs goes goes first uh, through. Now to answer your question about these uh, these uh, these temporary walls. The reasons for these walls is that these stations, which I was mainly showing to you today, they are really large. Uh, first of all, they are in soft ground. That's the first okay. thing what you really need to keep in mind. It's a soft what I, what I was showing is a soft ground tunneling, because for example, you know, if you will have a very good rock, you can do 40 meter uh, large station without any problem. Uh, so you know that's that's different story and that's that's basically like a different game. Uh, I was talking about uh, soft ground tunneling. So these these uh, stations in in soft ground, they they can have the the width roughly up to 20, 21 meter. Anything bigger than that becomes extremely difficult to to do. 
And because these stations, uh, these large caverns are so big, to make sure that we can uh, support uh, this big tunnel in these small small headings, we are introducing these, these side wall drifts. Uh, but if you are, for example, doing like a smaller tunnel, then you would have not then you would not have these uh, these side wall drifts. You would have just top heading bench invert. Then if it's a little bit bigger tunnel, maybe you would have one single side wall drift. And if it's really big tunnel, then you have two uh, side wall drifts. So it really depends on the size of your tunnel uh, in terms of how you are splitting the the, the excavation. Okay. So this uh, double no, side no. wall is used only for the biggest tunnels, like you know, like. 18 meter and, and, and larger or 17 meter and larger. OK, OK. Uh, now, uh, once uh, all the parts are being excavated, na, the whole tunnel will be supported on this along with the short pit, which will temporary line, which we'll do. Uh, like while excavating this, uh, we'll make sure that no load is there in the side walls, right? Sorry, I, I did not understand the question, sorry. Uh, we'll be doing multi, like bench by one bench, one one heading benching like this. Some like in stepwise we'll do excavation, right? Stepwise it's, we'll uh, do excavation, and then we'll give that outer lining tem tem temporary lining, right? Yeah, the 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 outer lining is a uh, is a temporary primary lining basically, and. Uh, all the all the temporary inverts and the the side wall drifts uh, which are within the 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 envelope of the primary lining which will stay there you know uh, to um, after we remove all the temporary shot creeds that's uh, that's you know permanent but all the, all the rest needs to be removed before you will apply the 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 waterproofing and uh, the loading of these temporary uh, elements of the temporary inverts and temporary uh, walls uh, is basically, you know, as you are progressing, uh, uh, you know, you always need to close the ring. Uh, that's basically what we are always saying when you are doing the an ATM in the subground tunneling. The thing what is very important is, is is fast ring closure. Even though in these drifts it's more like a fast triangle closure, but uh, we say fast ring closure. Uh, so you always want to be compact, you know, like you always want to have this 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 closed. You want to have that closed, so that's that's basically the reason why we have these temporary uh, walls and and inwards to close the ring. Okay, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I think uh, Mr. Sai Santosh has his doubts have been cleared, and we have another doubt by Madhu, and she states that uh, she would like to know more about the monitoring systems. So, can you be more specific about? in the tunneling or in the cut and cover part, you want to know about this uh, monitoring systems? Or can we just go for the tunneling part? Uh, the question is now like in tunnel monitoring, like prisms and like how we monitor the settlements of the tunnel or what do you mean now? What's the question? Yeah, actually question is quite generic, but uh, it uh, I think she, she is asking for uh, the tunnel monitoring system, yeah. OK, sure. sure. Uh, it's actually a very good point, and uh, I didn't really talk about it today because yeah. there are so many things uh, which you which you can and have to cover. But uh, it's it's absolutely the uh, right question and uh, monitoring and tunneling is absolutely necessary. It's uh, it's a key and without monitoring, we would not be actually able to tunnel because if you are tunneling without monitoring system, you would be tunneling blind and it's extremely dangerous and, yeah. and cannot be done. So you always need to install uh, the prisms into these small headings which we are which we were doing. So uh, there was a really large uh, number of, of, of monitoring prism installed every 10 meters uh, in these small sidewall drifts. It's minimum in minimum three, but sometimes we do even five. These temporary walls, they need to be also monitored always. And uh, you know, during the design, we are predicting the movements of these uh, of these monitoring points. And during the construction, we have uh, trigger values, uh, green, uh, amber, and red, which are basically telling us what we need to do. And uh, you know, we always hope that the monitoring results will match our design. From my experience, in reality, sometimes we are struggling 
Sometimes they, the contractor is installing these monitoring uh, points late, and they don't they, they don't show you then all the movements which the tunnel has, and that's a problem. So you always want to push your contractor to install uh, to install these monitoring points, you know, as soon as you can, uh, and then you want to measure them almost immediately, and uh, then you can see really the trend of the movement and of the settlement. So uh, it's a it's a it's a normal uh, monitoring points which we are mostly using. Sometimes you can also use extensometers uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, I will be honest with you. Most of the times, the normal traditional monitoring uh, of of uh, of prisms is is sufficient. And uh, nowadays, the total stations are very sophisticated, and the measurements can be plus minus one millimeter, and it's working very well. Just to add to the uh, Madhu's question, were there any building damages when you show the Chinatown tunnel? So were there any uh, building damages occurred during construction? Uh, no, there were no uh, there were no building damages. Uh, uh, everything was done uh, according to the predicted uh, predictions from the design. So the um, uh, the buildings were not not affected. Maybe for the benefit of of the people. Uh, before you will basically start project like this, what you need to do is that uh, uh, first you do a zone of influence. Uh, you are you are basically uh, uh, trying to see uh, what will happen after you will be building the the station, uh, where exactly will be the settlement trough, and then within the settlement trough you need to start worry about all your uh, buildings, utilities, and third party assets. Then when you know which assets or, or buildings will be affected, then you need to do a survey. You really need to go there. You need to take a photos and see if these structures are cracked or damaged and so on. And then based off based on basically the results uh, of the survey and the, the expected uh, settlements and tilt, tiltation from the design, then you need to you know calculate if these buildings will be affected in a negative way. And if they will, if they will be, then you have a lot of things what you can do to prevent the the, the damage. You can do uh, compensation grouting. You can do uh, uh, grouting uh, below the foundations of these buildings. You can do a pile wall, for example, to cut the, the settlement from such mm -hmm. a building or utility. There is really a large amount of things what you can do to protect the, the third party assets. OK, uh, it was quite informative and uh... Now we have a question by Piyush, so you can just state your question, Piyush. Yeah, hi Rushi. Hi Peter, thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two questions. One is the follow-up question from Sai Santosh. Uh, in that slide where we were seeing this uh, temporary side walls, you are also showing the pipe roof on the side temporary wall. So is that something which we usually do or because from where I'm asking this question, uh, we have not tried this uh, in any of our design before. When, when the, the the tunnel which I showed you was in 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 sand actually, and if mm -hmm. you would not put also the, the the umbrellas on the side, the sand would just collapse. So uh, we had to put there pipe umbrellas, and uh, if we couldn't put pipe umbrellas there, the classical normal uh, uh, steel pipes, which are usually 12 meter long, for example, it can be whatever. Uh, then we were installing uh, steel uh, spiles, like a short spiles, which are sh sh four meter short spiles. Length. And we were actually hammering them into the soft ground uh, in very close spacing, and we did them every meter. We, every uh, the excavation steps were one meter long, so every excavation step we installed these uh, these piles to the sides, and basically this uh, because they are uh, covering each other uh, as as you know they are four meter long, uh, so there is uh, overlap. And uh, by this, you know, you you make sure that the the, the this soft ground does not flow into your tunnel and cause a collapse. So that's why we had to also protect the sides, you know, not, not just the, the outside of the big tunnel, but also the insides, because uh, when you are tunneling this small triangle, you would you can have a collapse from any side. Yeah. So you need to basically treat the sides in the same way. OK, understood. And my second question was regarding this uh, modeling of short feet. You explained that, uh, you know, uh, in, if we assume it as elastic material, then many of the uh, points were going out of this MN curve. And then uh, when we switched to plastic, then everything is inside and it seems <laughs> OK. 
<laughs> but and I, uh, I, that's why that's that I need to uh, say something. It's not that okay. everything will be inside. Sometimes everything will be inside. There will be cases where it will not be okay, and you need to use some 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 rebars. But uh, quite often uh, it will be within that uh, that capacity limit curve, so it will work. What you are basically doing here is that uh, you are allowing the concrete to also work in tension. So the models which we are using in our in our calculations, and most of the times we are using software called Abacus, which is very good for uh, you know. Uh, um, ground structure interaction uh, modeling, and it's very good, uh, you know, for the model. It can model very well the the soil, but also very well the concrete. And quite often, the softwares which are used normally, then they are quite good in in, for example, modeling the soil, but they are terribly modeling the concrete, and vice versa. If you have something that is really good for concrete, usually it suck with uh, with 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 the ground model. And Abacus is kind of like, you know, very good in both. And that's why we are using this uh, and our analysis are allowing uh, for this this uh, use of this tension uh, tensile strength in the concrete. So around like zero point like minus zero point three megapascal tension we are allowing in this concrete and we are basically allowing some micro cracks to develop in our in our concrete mm -hmm. and by these micro cracks you are basically you know relaxing the 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 concrete and the stresses are distributed more around the around the opening and that's why it can be done but obviously in some cases you know it will not be enough and you will have to put traditional reinforcement yeah okay thank you for the explanation actually i wanted to bring this point out that what you just explained that this micro cracking so uh, you know sometimes we face problem in explaining to our client side that you know if we are using this plastic model and some cracking is happening. It is not the failure of the system. It, it, and, exactly. And, 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 and the structural engineers, you know, coming from their background that, OK, if it is uh, red, that means it is yielding and something is failing. So <laughs> it comes to a different uh, discussion altogether. So I mean, I, very helpful I that when you are explaining as a international expert that uh, this micro cracking is fine. It is not uh, causing any problem to my system at, as such. Yeah, absolutely, and you know you cannot even activate these uh, these steel fibers if you will not allow this uh, this behavior. Uh, so you know it actually needs needs to needs to happen. So, uh, but look, uh, there are many publications which are uh, which are written about this, uh, which are you know uh, uh, proven and they are used now for more than twenty years now. So you know. Uh, it's just you need to educate your your clients and and show them examples from around the world. Okay, thank you, Peter. You are most welcome. So, so Piyush, you can just uh, go back to our webinar on uh, Miss uh, Doctor Sue, and that you can find about this cracking and all in the multi-layer lining webinar. So, next questions we have from Mahalakshmi. She she is asking whether contact grouting arrangement through the final lining will puncture the waterproofing membrane or not, and and PCC lining can be used as final lining. This is a question. Can the PCC lining use as the final lining? Uh, what is PCC actually? I don't know what is PCC. plain cement concrete without reinforcement or without ah, okay. any. Uh, all right, all right, sure. So uh, no, the con the contact grouting needs to be done in the way that you are uh, that you are not puncturing the the waterproofing membrane. You are trying to do it without without that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have a compartment and you still have a leakage, uh, sometimes maybe you need to do some some drilling and pecker grouting. And during this drilling, you might damage the waterproofing, uh, but still you know the water will be within that compartment. But that's something that is very unusual. And if you will do installation of your waterproofing and your injection hoses well, then you don't uh, you don't need to to worry about it. The 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 contact routing what I was more referring to was was just that you don't have a gaps between yeah. you know primary lining and the secondary lining because it's difficult in the crown to always make sure that the, all the concrete goes all the way up. Uh, so yeah, that, that should not puncture the the, the waterproofing. And uh, plain concrete without uh, without any reinforcement, 
Uh, I was privileged to work with uh, with some great engineers uh, when I was in, in in Czech Republic, and we actually designed uh, quite a few uh, uh, tunnels, uh, mainly uh, railway tunnels, where the secondary lining was completely uh, plain, without not uh, without fibers, without steel fibers, and without bar reinforcement. So it was just a plain concrete, nothing nothing else. Uh, obviously, when you have junctions and stuff, then you know you need to put there something. But when it's a linear uh, tunnel and your calculations, you know, prove that it's possible, then definitely, you know, I'm I'm behind this. Uh, you know, plain concrete for secondary linings, if it can be used, uh, it's 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 great. But it would depend upon the geology of the uh, of the project, right? And the geometry it, as well. And and the codes and what the client wants and uh, what the, your category three checker allows you to do and uh, another one million things. <laughs> yeah. So the next question is from Supriya. She asks that can you elaborate about the installation of segments without TBMs and the tests that need to be performed for the segments? Uh, so I think that maybe I did not uh, explain it uh, maybe as as well as I could. These uh, these pilot tunnels which we had them in these stations, they were done by TBMs. So the TBM was doing the running tunnels, uh, and they passed through the normal TBM. They installed the normal normal segments. Sometimes what you can do from from environment point of view, that these segments which are, because they are temporary and they are within the stations. They can be different than the stations, uh, than the segments uh, outside of the station because you will be demolishing them. Uh, you know they can be less, less, uh, uh, less reinforcement, or they can be uh, shorter or larger, and so on. So they can be different uh, to make them basically cheaper and and uh, less, less durable. So they they were they were installed by the uh, by the TBM. Okay, and uh, we have another question by Sai Santosh. So if you want, you can just shoot out the question again. Hello, Sai Santosh. Oh, sorry, it's by mistake. Uh, okay, uh, we have a, a question by Rama Santosh Kiran. And he asks uh, that uh, what about the geometry of station with NATM compared to cut and cover method? Since we get box structure with cut and cover method with which we can have enough height, but in TV and uh, NATM tunnels, the tunnel span has to be large. Uh, so uh, I tried to address this this question at the beginning when I was saying that, uh, you know, there are different configurations to the NATM stations and uh, you know, it can be the large cavern or it can be the concourse and the cross passages and the platform tunnels. And uh, depending on the project and uh, and uh, requirements, we select the, the, the optimal option. Obviously, when you have a really large cutting cover box, uh, you know, you will always have more space than in these, uh, these tunnels. So what we usually do is that when we have these NATM stations, we are combining them with so-called uh, head houses. These are shafts which we are usually using for a construction of these NATM stations. And either we have two of these shafts or we have one large, which we then use as a either uh, we do this cross cut tunnel and uh, then we do the, 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 the platform uh, tunnel from this cross cut, which I was showing. So the equipment, you know, the, the ventilation systems and the, the all the mechanical and electrical uh, uh, equipments are in the shafts, uh, which is which is nearby. Uh, so you know, I agree that these uh, these uh, tunnels they cannot uh, match the large uh, any uh, the large uh, cut and cover stations, but we go around it that you know uh, the the heavy equipment is in the shaft, which is on the side, and these these NATM tunnels can be quite small, and then they are really just for you know passengers flow for escalators. For the trains, but you don't have a uh, power generators and stuff like that. That's in the shaft, which is which is next to it. 
So yeah, this was it. It was really a very interactive session today. We we don't receive much questions or over the webinars. To be honest, we usually <laughs> receive it after the webinar. So yeah, it was quite this webinar was quite informative and interactive as well. And yeah, I really like the way you explain that this uh, design, execution, and supervision should also go hand in hand. It's like a tripod, and that's what uh, we as a young engineer should uh, carry for carry this forward. And I'd like to thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. You had very good question. I enjoyed it. Uh, I wish you have a good weekend, uh, good evening, good night, and thanks so much. Yeah, and I just want to let our uh, audience know that Peter was also uh, my supervisor in this uh, young prof yeah, young planning professional uh, workshop in Gadans, and it was very uh, his ideas and our full team was very informed, very very knowledgeable, and I got to work with all the uh, people with different departments and intra intradisciplinary uh, workshop. It was with architects, urban planners. It's a very great initiative, and I would really uh, motivate all the people who are here to apply for this workshop as well. And uh, yeah, it is quite informative, and you will you will really learn a lot in this types of workshop. And we are they are all Aitakas and Isokap are also planning some workshop this year, and you will hear it from me soon. If they plan, I'll just uh, mail it to you as previously yeah. mentioned. People are interested, please, you know, go to uh, Itaku's website. You go first to the ITA, to the International Tunneling Association. Then there is a committee called Itakus, which is the committee for the underground space. And within this uh, Itakus committee, uh, Rosanne and myself, we are running uh, activity group, which is uh, for a young professional Think Deep program, which uh, Rushi... Uh, um, you know, uh, was part of, and uh, I think that he enjoyed it, uh, me as well. It's about cooperation between tunnel engineers and, and urban planners, because we we are saying is that, you know, when you are planning a city, you cannot work in silos, you know, the architects need to talk to us and we need to talk to them and to urban planners, because without that, you cannot have a holistic uh, approach, you cannot have a solid a solid solution. So, you know, go to that website, have, have some read, and as Rushi said, we will be uh, doing these programs uh, uh, this year and ne next year. And we will be more than happy if, if some of you guys will apply. And hopefully we will see each other on one of these future programs. So very good. Thank you so much for that input, Rushi. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for this wonderful webinar. And I'm, 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 I'm confident that your experience will be very useful for our young, young generation. And this webinar especially will be also uh, used as a reference as well on youtube so yeah you can access this webinar on youtube as well and okay everyone bye have a nice weekend bye bye thank you bye